morning, everyone. Good morning. So, my name is Krista Oni. I am the Youth and Young Adults um, Ministries Human at this church. And um, I am filling in for Pastor Devin today. So, if you were at the 9 a.m. service, you already know that um, he's not with us today. And so, but you know, he's such a prepared human that he just like gave Marty and I the things that we need. So, you will still have his words and all the things he prepared for our study. Um, you just get my bubbly personality instead of his. So, <laughs> haha. I'm not gonna say that my personality is bubblier than his, but it is. So, um, I'm so glad you all are here. Does everyone have a Bible? If you're, if you don't have a Bible, there is one. Um, I believe on either set of tables, but for sure this table and my left towards the right in the room. So um, you will need one of those because we're going to be looking up some scripture at the end of our study. Today, if you have a Bible app and you'd rather use a Bible app, cool. Susan Southall being so hip and with it. I love it. All right, so um, as we get started, let us take a moment. Um, please uh, join me in a moment of prayer. Lord, as we come to you in your word this morning, I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts, that you would open our um, any preconceived notions about you or your word that we might um, have so that we would be inspired to see your word come to life in our neighbors and our enemies, that we might recognize the diversity of thought that we bring as we come closer to you and each other. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, so um, there is a covenant um, as we are doing this series. Um, we are remembering our covenant together that um, your thoughts are welcome. Your doubts are welcome. We're in this together. Respect each other. Speak your mind. And love your neighbor. So we're going to review what, what you all discussed so far. Um, so far, we've discussed the span of the Bible, which was written over 1,500 years ago by at least 40 different authors, and we discussed how Jesus interpreted scripture, and that mattered. In the second session, so I, last week, we talked about Paul and what he meant by scripture being inspired, and inspiration is interconnected with how we interpret Hebrew and Greek and how we translate those into English and how that's a little bit more complicated than um, it might seem on the surface. And so when it comes to these languages and translating English, um, we're going to see how that um, is just more complex and that's going to lead most of our discussion today. Um, last week, you are asked to look up some English interpretations of your favorite book and compare them. Um, did anyone do that? Mm -hmm. If not, this is an excellent opportunity to pretend like you did. Because we're going to take just a couple of minutes um, and share just with people at your table or a buddy next to you. Um, just a couple of moments to share what you looked up. Um, what different translations you looked at, um, and just any curiosities about what you found in doing that. So we're gonna have just a couple of minutes for you to discuss with your neighbors at your table. So what was your favorite? Well, that's part of why picking a translation. If you're mid-story, finish your story with your friends. Hopefully you learned some cool things that everyone got excited or interested about, or maybe you learned a new recipe. I don't know what you talked about. Um, <laughs> so um, today we're going to be spending some time getting into various interpretations, um, which often goes overlooked, but they really do play a really big part in how we read the Bible and what we say the Bible says. Um, and what we say the Bible says depends somewhat on the Bible translation that we read from. And so, 
So an accurate Bible translation, um, we're going to look at kind of comparing different ways that that's broken down. So um, let's just maybe spend a moment considering various English translations of scripture and how those translate. Um, has anyone ever studied a foreign language? You can just raise your hand if you have. Yeah, me, some, a little bit. Um, and so for those that have studied a foreign language, what are some problems that you've ever run into in that language when trying to translate English? The order of the words. The order of the words? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay. There's a pillar here. Um, yes, yeah. And so not just like the order of the words, but like, especially when it comes to Hebrew and Greek, um, there are certain idioms or expressions, um, and in any language, but those, there are certain things that are specific to each language, and whenever you try to translate, sometimes um, those idioms don't always translate accurately um, from the original language to another language like English. And so we talked last week a little bit about how when we ask the question, um, you know, is it Jesus or is it Yeshua? Um, we talked about when you translate Jesus into English, that that word, that name, loses some of the deeper meaning to the name of Jesus. Um, and this is certainly true of Hebrew and Greek. Um, and so English translations vary, but they mostly vary um, our translations of the Bible by what's called a word-for-word -word translation of the Bible and a thought-for-thought -thought translation of the Bible. And so on your table, you should have, you're probably used to this already, but there are some sheets. So if you want to, if you're a note taker and you want to kind of follow along and take some notes, um, feel free to do so. So our word-for-word -word, um, translation of the Bible, word-for-word, -word, also called literal translation, is regarded as the most technically accurate. Um, it leaves the least wiggle room for error or misunderstanding. And so some like examples of that might be um, the NASB, the, the King James, the English Standard Version, um, the New English Translation. All of those um, Bible translations are considered word-for-word -word translations. And so we're going to look at an example of what that looks like in a minute. And then our other is thought for thought translation of the Bible. Thought for thought just takes the perspective up a level from the word for word. Um, so the translator, the person translating from the original text into English, evaluates a series of words in its original, original language and then um, it, that... Uh, comprise a thought or that put together and, ex and express a thought in the target language um, that it's trying to translate into, uh, which in our case here is English. Um, and so thought for thought translation is known as a dynamic equivalence. And these translations are tend to be easier to read um, than a typical word for word translation. And so our example that we're going to look at is John 3.16. Our word-for-word -word translation would translate it this way. For God did so love the world that his son, the only begotten, he gave that everyone who is believing in him may not perish but may have life age during. And so that's the Young's literal translation, a word-for-word -word translation. Now, a thought-for-thought -thought that comes from our New Living Translation, which a lot of us might have that translation in front of us, says it this way. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have life eternal. Do we see the, the difference as you kind of look at those two translations? Head nods are helpful. <laughs> yes, no, kind of. Yeah, the thought for thought, it might, it rolls off the tongue a little bit easier, but the word for word is, 
may be more technically accurate to the original um, language. So another example we have is Psalm 23.1. So we're going to start with our thought for thought example. Um, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need, which is the good news translation of the Bible. Now, a word for word translation is the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, which comes from our new American standard Bible translation. And these two translations, depending on like where you're at when you read them might have super different meaning meanings you might interpret those different unless you've been taught kind of how to interpret them but if you just read them face value um, that i shall not want can sound like i don't want my shepherd around here but the thought for thought kind of explains that oh no with my shepherd i have everything i need and so while the thought for thought can make it a little bit easier to hear or to speak, a pitfall of the thought for thought translation is that it leads to interpretive decisions that can sometimes miss the point of the original text and introduce um, maybe foreign ideas that the original language wasn't trying to communicate. And so if translators take too much liberty or freedom with the text, interpretive errors may prevent a faithful communication of God's word. Um, and it's also important to know that, you know, there is some natural um, subjectivity that exists within um, thought for thought, allowing for a wide variety of interpretations at the same time. So uh, translators of those thought for thought translations of scripture um, it means that they're going to be inserting their opinion um, into the text because they are interpreting the text based on their thought process. Whereas a word-for-word -word translation is literally just trying to line up the right words in the sentence with the original language. Um, so another example is when Moses throws the tree into bitter waters of Mara in Exodus 15.25, the NASB, which is a literal word-for-word -word translation, says the waters become sweet. On the other hand, the thought-for-thought -thought translation for that, which comes from the NIV, says the water became fit to drink. And so... Both translations are accurate in their own way. Um, the water became portable, whether it's called sweet or whether it's simply called fit to drink, both communicate, we can drink this water. Um, and so along with our thought for thought and our word for word, so are we kind of tracking what word for word is? Thought, excellent, excellent. So we now have another um, Another translation, which is a paraphrased translation of the Bible. And so uh, on your first page, that third kind of paragraph um, is going to be where we are in the fill in the blank, if you're following along in that uh, rhythm. But the, um, a paraphrased translation of the Bible seeks to make the Bible more understandable to the reader. It may elaborate more on the context in a way designed to help the reader understand the passage better. Um, there are other translations, but um, they seem to stem out of kind of, there may be other translations of the Bible that are outside of these three kind of models we're looking at today, but to avoid confusion and to consolidate, because we have 40 minutes, um, those are the three that Pastor Dunn is uh, having us focus on today. So, um, so to paragraph, so this paraphrasing translation, to paragraph in the dictionary definition um, just means to, uh, means a restatement of a text or passage giving the meaning in another form as for clearness or rewording. So a paragraph often uses a lot more words in an effort to more fully describe the meaning of the words coming from the original language. Um, and this way of translating, um, this helps readers to easily perceive um, 
to help understand or share it in a language or story that makes sense, um, that additional shades of meaning they might not otherwise uh, see from a standard translation. Because while most people have access to a Bible today, um, a lot of people might not have access to theological resources to help them interpret things based on what's being said. Um, and so a good comparison can be made by comparing a well-known passage like John 1.1 1, 1 in the King James Version and in the Phillips Version. So John 1.1, 1, 1, so our word-for-word -word translation here is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in our paraphrase translation, in our Phillips um, translation, we have, at the beginning, God expressed himself. That personal expression, that word, was with God and was God, and he existed with God from the beginning. So a paragraph translation like Philip's translation, it uses more words, um, and it's easy to see that it's you know, it's still communicating the same meaning, um, and so it's not necessarily adding or subtracting from the original meaning, but it can help the reader make more sense of what it's saying. Okay, so where are we now? That's a lot of information, right? Okay. So, da, 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 da. all right. So it we're we're coming up to the point we're about to look up some scripture. So just go ahead and have your Bible handy, and and so. We, we share all this, the word for word, thought for thought, paragraph. We look at all of these different ways of translating side by side and say all of this to say that, um, that it's complex, right? And I think Pastor Devin, the last couple weeks, have, has tried to reiterate that thing, that there's a lot of complexity. And when we begin to look closely at some of this, that we can see that along with the quadrilateral, which books of the Bible we consider to be inspired, um, plus, you know, maybe our own biased views, we bring the, the views that we bring to reading scripture. Um, it's a lot more complicated than we think that it is. Um, and I want to invite us to get out of the mindset that the Bible needs to be defended. Um, the Bible doesn't need to be defended. However, your view of the Bible does. It doesn't mean we have to live our lives questioning everything around Scripture all the time. But I do want us to get out of the posture of defending the Word of God as if God's Word is dependent on you or me. And so we're going to get into that. Devin's going to talk more about that in the next session. But um, before we move on, um, we're going to look at one final passage, kind of considering these different ways of interpreting scripture. And so if you would, um, and then we're going to, there's going to, in your packet, there's a chart that's kind of, that's like broken these down side by side for you. But if you would, go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy 1, 8 through 11. And if you're using the physical book and it's hard, at the beginning, there's a table of contents. And I still have to use the table of contents because there's a lot of books in the Bible. So it's okay to flip to the front, figure out where 1 Timothy is, and go from there. So once you kind of find it at your own tables, we're going to spend some time looking at um, the word for word, thought for thought, and paraphrase versions of this text together. But I'm going to give you a few minutes that at your table, read this together out loud. So you're going to hear a lot of people reading scripture around you, um, but take a few minutes at your table and read it together. <clears throat> 
starting now. Okay, has everyone had a chance to read at your table? Lovely! Excellent. Okay, so, so looking at this scripture um, that you all just read at your table, there's a list of sins that the writer wants us to know about. Um, and returning to the concept of these three different types of translations, right, our word for word, our thought for thought, our paraphrase, um, that lists, um, <clears throat> the list varies somewhat based on the English translation. So let's all find, a, it's a very colorful, uh, I don't know, what is this? Picture, chart, that's the word. Thank you. There's a colorful chart. And we're just going to go through this together. So, and so in our word for word, um, kind of like picking our sins in that category, we have lawless, disobedient, godless, sinful, unholy, profane, murderer, Dads, moms, immoral, defile with human, defile with mankind, men stealers, um, perjured person, contrary to sound doctrine. Um, so, in a word-for-word -word translation, if you were reading from one of those translations, those might be some of the words that were listed in your translation. Um, if you were reading from a thought-for-thought -thought translation, some of the words that may have come up would have been lawbreaker, rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, irreligious, murder their dad's moms, sexually immoral, practicing homosexuals, slave traders, liars, perjurers, contrary to sound doctrine. If you are reading from a paraphrase version like Phillips or The Message or something like that, um, you might see lawbreakers, criminals, ungodly, non-religious, non-spiritual, murder their dad's moms, whoremongers, sexual perverts, kidnappers, false testimony, contrary to sound doctrine. So, um, and there's some kind of overlap, right? Like there's a, some word for word and some thought for thought share some things, some thought for thought and paraphrase share some things. But we can see, depending on the translation style we have, it is communicating differently. And in our, interpreti in our interpreting the Bible discussion, um, I do think it's helpful to bring, um, to bring this up. Let me make sure I got my sheet. Okay, so looking at the scripture, um, right, we see our list of sins that the writer wants us to know about, and returning to the concept of the three different types of translations, uh, you know, these vary. And, and I think it's important and it's helpful for us to bring this up, though we're not going to unpack this today. This is a, something that Devin is going to be teaching on in the future um, and in the next study on sexuality and scripture. But this is an issue that we're facing right now around biblical interpretation. Um, we're asking questions like, what does the Bible say about sexuality? And as we kind of look at interpretation and how things get interpreted, um, we can see that there are discrepancies. Um, the more literal our word-for-word -word translation the more we go in that realm, the less easy it is to pinpoint what we define as homosexuality. Um, and what we define as homosexuality today in reference to the scripture that gets cited from the original Greek and Hebrew and, and the word homosexual, it's important to note that that doesn't appear or get added into the Bible through translation until the 1950s. Before that, most translations use the word fornication, which is not the same thing as homosexuality. And again, we'll get more into that later. That's something Pastor Devin, these are his words, and this is something he's going to teach on. Um, so we'll be getting into that in our next study on sexuality and scripture. 
and understanding how interpretation plays a part into all of this. Um, but once again, translating into English is complicated. It's complicated. And again, we're not here to defend our interpretation, um, but we're here to learn together and um, to get curious with one another. Um, and so that's going to bring us to the end of our discussion today. Um, uh, and it's going to bring us to the end of the discussion on this section of the study on um, right and wrong and interpreting English. In the grand scheme of things, what I hope for um, and what Pastor Devin is hoping for is for us to uncover um, that it was never about being right or wrong, um, that it was never about defending our view, but learning and growing and seeking. So there's a quote on, well prepared as this man is. Ooh, he's got a lot of paper. <laughs> okay, so there's a, um, a quote from um, the Church of England article of religion that says, Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whosoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man. That that is that is should uh, be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. So that's a lot. <laughs> what do we do with inter interpretations of scripture? What is the author trying to tell us? And maybe instead of viewing this as something to be defended or even avoided, maybe we can begin to see that this is everything that we need for salvation. And yes, there are complicated factors in making sense of translation and of inspiration. But maybe it's less about um, less about is this right or wrong, and more about something deeper. And asking what kind of book is this anyway? And we're going to be talking more about that next week. So there's some homework. It's fun homework, and that is um, Devin wants you to read for next week. Genesis 1 through 3 and bring back a list of differences between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and 3 and we will be discussing that together. So thank you for your time. Feel free to like stick around for a little bit and discuss and yes. is regarded as the most accurate. So I got the I'm just going to let you look at it. Okay. Anyone who is missing things, come up here afterward and we can fill it in together that way. Okay, <laughs> let's pray. Oh, God, you are good. Um, and we, we thank you that your, your spirit is big enough to transcend um, time and space and um, thought and has the beautiful ability to unite and bring us together. And so God, as we um, are people who are journeying together, I pray that um, you would fill us with curiosity, that you would fill us with openness and center our hearts on love for one another and neighbor um, and for us to be the hands and feet of your love in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.